Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kostuba Das. Welcome to our show. Welcome to Sleep in Sunday. And Sleep in Sunday is a day we have special guests come on the show. And today we have a very, very honored guest. Now, I have her whole bio here. Um, but right. I'm not going to... Let me just share about Krishna Anandini's bio. Because, some, because, I, I, because I'm a father of five. Everything she's done in the world, I was like, that's nothing. This woman is a dedicated mother of 10 children. That's all you need for a bio as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I think you have, I think you get the express train right back to the spiritual realm for pulling that one off. I don't, I don't care what, it, I don't care if you're a PhD at Harvard and Cornell, double majors, I don't interested. You mother 10 children. She is a Vaishnav minister, a certified family life educator, president of the Grihasta vision team. Grihastas are married couples, spiritually married couples. Um, co-director of Dasi Diad Institute. Raised in a Christian family, she studied Islam, Mormonism, and other religions, and eventually came to her bhakti path of Vaishnavism. And she was a dedicated, initiated follower of Prabhupada, who brought these teachings of bhakti to the West in, 19, uh, in 1972. Uh, she and her husband, Tariq, have designed and implemented workshops and curriculums related to marriage, family counseling, and youth counseling. I could really use you in my life, Krishnandini. <laughs> Welcome to the show. We are honored to have you, and we are honored to pick your brain and get all the wisdom and knowledge out of you so you can shed some light in our dark lives. Welcome to the show. Oh, well, thank you, Raghunath. I am so grateful to be a part of the show. And uh, if whatever's left after the, 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 the children, I want to share with the world. So uh, uh, go uh, for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I, I would like to share, you know, one um, sobering thought is that, Krishna Nandini, you, you are actually, you're in your home right now, yes. but you're receiving hospice care. Yes. And you, you have cancer. Yes. And you're preparing for the for the final days of your life right now. Yes. yes. Yeah. So 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 you know in interviewing you, uh, I had a thought, and that was I, I remembered the book by Khalil Gibran mm -hmm. called The Prophet. Okay. And that's a book. Uh, it's a beautiful book. I, I imagine many of our readers have, have many of our listeners have read it before. And it's a book where there's a sadhu, uh, you know, a, a saintly, wise person, the prophet. And uh, the book opens where he's, I think he's like up on a cliff and you can see in the distance a boat is coming. And, and he knows that's a boat coming from his homeland where he lived many years ago. And he knows that tomorrow he's going to get on that boat and go and he'll never come back. And, and the, the local people, they, they have so much love and respect for him that they come forward and they all ask different questions, one topic after another. Just It's v very general topics. And the prophet shares his thoughts on those topics, and you know, you're, you're our prophet. You're our prophet today. <laughs> you're our, you're our sage, and um, we just would like to put very general 
okay. ideas before you and just let you, you know, for so many reasons, for someone who's been practicing bhakti nearly 50 years, yes. for someone who has, who grew up in a large family, who's had a very large family of her own, yeah. who's, who's worked deeply in counseling, family counseling and, you know, uh, raising children and written books on this and, and so much that uh, let us ask you questions on these topics in general and let you to your heart's content just share what you feel we could benefit from. We have an audience of many thousands of people okay. who are eager to practice bhakti yoga, eager to deepen their spiritual life on one level or another. Yeah. And for you to just share messages with us that we might be able to apply in our life would be, uh, uh, we'd be just so grateful for that. And it'd be an honor for me as well. Okay, and, and you know, I, I wanna get to these questions quickly. And therefore, there's some interesting stories about your life that I would like to just tell in a quick nutshell. Yes, please. Um, rather than we could have you share it yourself, but you've shared it in previous interviews that are up online and, and, and our listeners could search those out. But it was Kustu, your uh, Yes. Kustu, before you jump in, let me just welcome all the Facebook people. If you're sure. listening live on Facebook, we do this every day. It's a study of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the sacred yoga wisdom literature. It is the preeminent, uh, I'd say the preeminent uh, work of all the Vedas, according to the author himself. So if you're interested in yoga, spiritual culture, yoga lifestyle, and like the yoga wisdom, want to apply it to your life, join us. Um, you can uh, back listen to all our episodes on Wisdom of the Sages, wherever you get podcasts, or you can join us every morning at 5 a.m. when we study. Saturday and Sunday is at eight, generally. Today's at noon. And um, how would they find that? They would write Mara at Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. That's Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. And she'll give you all the codes to jump into our secret group, Zoom group. All right. And so, okay. So, Krishna Nandini, it was yes. your mother who yes. was a very spiritual woman. Yes who was interested in studying all the different world religions and she began to practice them all. Yes. So as you were a child, you, you, you had experience of many, of not only hearing about, but even practicing different world religions. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And then I believe it was her brother that one day received a Back to Godhead magazine. Yes, my brother, my oldest brother. Oh, it was your brother, not her brother. Mm. Okay. My, and, my oldest brother. Okay, your, your, your eldest brother, Got this Back to Godhead magazine, which was a magazine of the Krishna consciousness movement that was all about bhakti yoga. And I think the way that you said it was, you, he knew yeah. that if she sees this magazine, she's going to just get to die yeah. <laughs> headlong into this. And he hid it from her, because stupid, he didn't give it to her right away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was all about 17, 18, 19 himself. You know, He's he a, mom's going to be into this. I'm not sure if I'm ready for it. I'm going to hold on to it for now. And, uh, but he did give it to her. He did eventually give it to her. And he was right. She immediately like just totally plugged into it. That's right. Okay. And you were, your family was based in Cleveland at this time. Yes. And there was a very small storefront temple. This was late 60s, early 70s? Early 70s. The, the first, very first temple was a storefront temple in Cleveland. And uh, 1970, I, I want to say, devotees came from Detroit and mm -hmm. Columbus to set up the first temple there. And okay. My mother actually was one of the first people who contributed to getting that um, established. Oh, you, your mother was very involved yeah. in that. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. She gave but up it, her furniture, she gave up her everything and just- went So ahead. dedicated. Mm -hmm. But somehow there was also some tension between her and the management of that little temple. Yes. And she already had all of you head shaved, wearing saris, doing different yes. things. <laughs> okay. Well, what? for me, Kostuba, I was, um, at this time, I was in Chicago. I had gotten a scholarship to the University of Chicago. Okay. And so uh, in this initial stages, it was just my mother and the other family. And mm -hmm. then a few months later, she came and gave me a Bhagavad Gita, and that's how I got introduced. That was your first okay. uh, introduction. Okay. So at, at a certain point around this time, your family was kind of looking for a community where they could settle down and be accepted yes. to practice. Yes. yes. And uh, you landed on the doorstep of uh, the, the, the Dallas oh, yeah. uh, Hare Krishna Temple, which is a place where I've spent a lot of time. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why My guru was Tamal Krishna Goswami. Oh, well, good. 
yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, I got to know him a little better, Kastuba. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we 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 uh, ended up in Dallas as a series of very mystical things that you know only you, you, you'd have to know some divine intervention. Yeah, we had never been in Dallas. We never we didn't know anybody. We didn't even know that there was a Hare Krishna temple in Dallas until we almost got there. So it was wow. a lot. Okay, <laughs> and and so you had a family of how many members were traveling at this point, kind of looking was, for a spiritual home? It was my mother. Uh, and five siblings, five of my siblings, two, four, it's four of my siblings, myself and my youngest daughter, uh, who's two at the time, I okay. got married by this time, and my first husband who actually came and drove us to Dallas, wow. to facilitate our getting there. And um, then later my stepfather came once we learned that Prabhupada was coming. Well, that's the thing, right? You, did, you had no idea, but when you that got there, you no found idea. out the very next day, yes, Srila Prabhupada was arriving there. Yes, and um, and I think you know you you mentioned that the the, the whatever the management there kind of called the people back in Cleveland, yes. <laughs> and, they were, and the people in Cleveland were saying, no, you know these people, I, I don't it's think they're ready it. for this. Yeah, don't let them in. <laughs> don't let them in, but but they let you in. Yeah, and um, and and then Shil Prabhupada initiated you and and your mother and and other members of your family yeah. into the into the practice of bhakti yoga, giving you the name and, and the the mantra and the practices yeah. at that time. Nineteen seventy two, Radhasmi, very special auspicious day of the. Just of we Pen. just celebrated. Yeah. Yeah, that on that day we got initiated, and then that wow. day so forty eight years ago. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and um, and and there's a story that. Uh, some some of those management they were telling Shri Prabhupada these people aren't ready for it they don't know enough about this right, right. now or they're right. not committed enough something like that they were they were kind of asking him to, discouraging Prabhupada from taking a step but what did Shri Prabhupada say he said wherever I see a spark of Krishna consciousness I must fan it I must fan wherever it wherever I see a spark Kastuba mm. what love what generosity what just you know and of course, that set the tone for the rest of our life. And now you're a volcano. A volcano. <laughs> Shoosh! Okay. Something's on fire, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so Krishnandini Devi, I, I, uh, we would like to present some questions to you. And, and again, uh, you're speaking to a wide audience. So it, it's, it's just a chance for us to, to just hear on these important topics. You know, what since we Raghunath and I did this podcast, like we started doing it just Raghunath started on his own about a, a year and a half ago. And he was just doing it for a few friends on Zoom. This was even before COVID and all that. He was on Zoom. <laughs> and then I would be a guest kind of host on that. And then eventually we started doing it together. And it was a small group of people just just here on Zoom. Okay. Uh, but they were very dedicated and it grew from 20 to 30 to 50 to 80. And, and um and and what we really discovered was there's so many people that are ready for bhakti yoga. There's so many people that are eager. You know, they come to a point in life, they've been married, they've had some few kids, they've gone through some ups, some downs, they face some struggles, they've and they reach a point where they really want something deeper in life and they're they're very open to it. And and uh and when when the wisdom of a tradition like this can be applied practically in life, like how do I deal with this marriage issue? Yes. How do I deal with going to work and, the, and, and those people don't understand what I'm practicing? Yes. How do I deal with the disappointments or struggles I go through with, with children and the fears that I face? And I think especially nowadays, people are really worried about the world in general, you know, um, with the leaders and tensions and, and so on. So, um, I, I feel that whatever you share, it will be absorbed and it will be practically applied and, and it'll be something important for people to, um, to use as, as uh, important uh, steps to take forward on their spiritual practice. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So let me begin with a, a, a simple question. Yes. Um, in, through your journey through life and your five decades of practicing bhakti yoga, what, what does it mean to be a good friend? To be a good friend means that you have the best interests of your friend at heart. 
It means that you're willing to sacrifice so that your friend can be all right. It means that you are the well-wisher in all the times, you know. And this is so important, Kastuba. You know, we, in, we have the Bhagavad Gita, which is the, the book mm-hmm. and the song of God. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, the Supreme, he explains the different kinds of friendship. Mm-hmm. So there's Sarit, which is the topmost friendship level, where one is just the everywhere wish it. There's no condition to my love and respect and service to you. And then there's Mitra, which is sort of a uh, social friendship. It's a good friendship, but it's not as deep. And then there's Bandhu, which is another term, which means sort of uh, acquaintance kind of thing, but a real friend. A friend in need is a friend indeed, as we've heard mm-hmm. that expression. And my grandmother used to say that if you want to be a fr- have a friend, you must first show yourself friendly. So this idea of friendship is really the um, essence of relationships. Even sometimes, because we ask people, we had couples that we work with hundreds and maybe thousands now. We asked them, what is the thing after, you know, that sustains your marriage? Friendship, that, that element of I am your friend. Mm. I may have, you know, this romantic attachment or I may have this infatuation. Of, but ultimately, I am your friend and you're my friend. And that friendship is the basis of our interaction and our love. And friendship exposes us to vulnerabilities. You know, we have to be who we are. We have to let people see the good, the bad, the nitty, the gritty. Mm. And so this desire for friendship is really an, a spiritual desire. It's actually a need of the spirit soul. And this is why our greatest friend is God himself, who comes through so many forms to be our friend, you know, and he's all, the scriptures say that God travels with us in all the varieties of bodies that we have because he's our friend. The super soul in the heart. Yes. Your friends don't leave you. They're there for you. So this idea of friendship is a very, very important element of just spiritual life just existing. And, you know, being a friend entails uh, a reciprocation. You know, I give, I take, I, you know, exchanges of love one person to another. And so all of us are looking for that ultimate friend. We're all looking for that because that is the fulfillment of the desire. And you know, if you if you notice, Kastuba, a lot of times that people they want when they reach out for something, you know, yes. it may be apparently a material thing they're asking for, but really what, what we want is that friendship, that spiritual relationship where it's not based on what I can do for you, what I can't do for you. It's just because you're a part of life and I care. That's it. Yeah. Beautiful. It's it's interesting how there are so many different Sanskrit terms for for friend. Friendship, right, right. Yeah, it's such a, it's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, you mentioned about vulnerability that you have to be able to really show. You know, I think one thing we get a lot of feedback about the podcast. Yeah. And and a lot of times people really appreciate Raghunath Prabhu's vulnerability that he's right here in public just laying it all yeah. out there. You know, his okay. his weaknesses, his struggles. Yeah. But yeah. some of us find that hard to do. Yeah. yeah. But it's so important to do it, Kastuba, because, you know, if we don't do that, we'll be superficial spiritualists. We don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We don't allow ourselves to go to the real essence of who we are. Because basically, we're all spiritual beings. We're all pure. And so we, we want to identify with that purity. With I'm a good person. I'm a clean person. I'm a truthful person. But because we have um, been covered for a lot of different lifetimes. We buried over with all this conditioning, right? Yeah. And so we have to be willing to let the conditioning flow off. And we have to be willing to be honest with ourselves and others. And the greatest spiritual progress we'll ever make is for those who are willing to be vulnerable and to mm. be honest. I mean, you have to be careful though. I mean, you, you, you have to be able to choose wisely how to be vulnerable in certain situations sometimes. But the idea is being honest with yourself. You know, being honest, who am I? What am I struggling with? What am I deal- dealing with? What, what are my challenges? You know, how am I pretending 
to be something that I'm not? And what is it that I really want to be? So with that mood in mind, and then doing your spiritual practices, you'll, we'll get cleansed and we can allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And it doesn't really matter what people think. The honesty, the truth is there in the heart. And God is there in the heart. So we become revealed and the truth will set us free. Our own truth about who we are, where we are, where we're going, that honest level of struggle. And then we can make progress. Because then if you identify where you are and what you're struggling with, then you, you know how to start dealing with it. But if we're pretending that I'm not really struggling or I'm certain place, then you won't make any progress. So it's important to be vulnerable in the right um, situation and being honest with oneself. Thank you. Um, I'm, I want to ask you, um, again, you have so much, not only experience, but these are things, I, by the way, I want to plug, you've, you've, you've worked on many books in terms of counseling, in terms of family, in terms of marriage and things like that. But at least like one book I want to put out there just to plug it is a book called um, Heart and Soul Connection. Yes, 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 uh, yes. A devotional guide to marriage, service and love, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a book that you worked with a, a group on. Finally. Yes, we yeah. worked uh, for four years on that book, uh, Labor of Love, um, and it's very practical, kastuba, but very devotional. And that was the that was the idea. Like, how do we, how do we take spiritual life and really practice it in a in a marriage setting or family mm -hmm. setting or friendship setting, and and again being with the vulnerabilities and the truth. And so we really had a team effort where the teamwork made the dream work with that book. <laughs> nice. And okay. whoever gets that book, they get a jewel. I'm serious. And people have said that all over again. And it's, it's, you know, we talk about communication, we talk about finance, we talk about sex, all in the realm of how do you, you know, how do you do your spiritual life? How do you make progress? How do you grow? Mm. And, um, you know, people have said that it's been very, very helpful and it's a, like a reference book that you can refer to over and over again. So whatever we may not cover today in the interview, that, that book you can yes. find more. Yes. Okay. yes. Heart and Soul Connection. Yeah. What was so, the emotional guide to marriage service and love. Yeah. Would you I, like to? Yeah. You want us to go ahead, Robert? Well, I'm eager. Now I'm yeah, very yeah, eager. Yeah, I want the marriage, <laughs> parenting. I want to get some of these questions out. If you could give three powerful pillars of advice for married couples, what could they be? Or people thinking about getting married, what could those pillars be? Something we can hold on to in tough times? Okay, so people thinking about getting married, I would give a little different. Okay, we can do both. Okay, yeah, let's do that first. Okay, well, people thinking about getting married, we would highly recommend that you do what we call premarital education. Okay. Like this is, you get with some uh, counselors, family life educators, people who are experienced and concerned and who care, who can take you through a series of sessions, at least eight to 10, one hour sessions. You've least. created a system, right? You've, yes. You've yes. Yeah. And in the sessions you work with, you talk about communication, you talk about finance, you talk about parenting, you talk about baggage that everybody brings, because we all have our baggage that we're bringing in, throwing in the door when we get, you know. Not me. <laughs> I came in this clean. <laughs> in, yes. And you talk about, you know, some of the uh, fears and words that you have. You talk about how you, how will you apply your spiritual life. You talk about what are your common goals. So yeah. that is the first part now. That's one thing. Do you get premarital education? And then the other thing is to really pray and seriously consider what are you looking for? What do you want? Like we, uh, Raghunathi mentioned grahasta as opposed to another term that grahasta means a, a marriage based on spiritual principles and based on wanting to grow together spiritually. Um, and so the other kind of marriage, the selfish marriage, griha maybe, or that kind of thing, it has time periods. It, 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 it's, you know, you do for me today and then what you can't do for me and then, you know, so you want to ask yourself, what is it that I want in my life as a person who's trying to know myself, know God? What, what is it? And I tell you what happened for me, Raghunath, my brother, my oldest brother, 
um, he, I had been married before and he, um, I was divorced and he came to me one day and he said, sis, you know, the husband you had, blah, 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 let's do something. He said, I want us to sit down and write down a list of all the qualities that you really think you would like in a husband. Mm. And then we're going to offer this to God. My brother was a Christian minister. And then we're going to just surrender everything. And he said, be really honest. If it's important, write it down. So we made this list. And I have this list to this day, recognized it's 30 something years old. Bless my brother's heart. Um, and then we offered it to the Lord. And I forgot to put wealthy on there though. <laughs> 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 but you know, actually, it wasn't that important to me because I always have felt that once you get to the right uh, union and it's offered to the Lord, whatever you need, it'll, it'll come. So I didn't worry about that. But okay. I did put, you know, things like a sense of humor, someone who loved and respected Prabhupada, my guru. You know, those kinds of things were on mm -hmm. me. Uh, someone who was like to read, for example, someone who was clean, and then. Ideally, what we do, we do this in a, uh, a service. We ask people, okay, now you have your long list of what you want in a spouse. Which of those qualities do you have? You have to ask yourself. Uh huh. That. Turn oh, it back on yourself. Yeah, 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 All yeah. All right. So that's a really good little exercise that one should do. And then the other thing is to really pray to understand the meaning of what is marriage today. You know, like the different people have different concepts about marriage and marriage is a union of people who want to come together and help each other grow ultimately spiritual marriage grow spiritually physically financial all the ways that you can grow a marriage should, should do that kind of thing and um so there's certain qualities in that such as forgiveness because inevitably we are going to do or say something to hurt the person we don't mean to this material world is conditioning so being able to forgive being able to um, be vulnerable again in the relationship. So I would say premarital education, making a, a, a good assessment or understanding of what is it you're looking for, and then evaluating yourself to see what you had, you know, and then um, making sure that you pray for guidance that the, the, the marriage that you have is a marriage that can be like an offering to life your family, to your community, to the world. Like Beautiful. That. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, it's kind of uh, branching off that same topic. You know, it, it's, it's um, we live in an interesting time where, you know, there's been so much, you know, throughout the ages, but, you know, even in modern, up to modern day, there's, there's exploitation in all different kinds of relationships. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, exploitation from men towards women, you know, is especially prominent. Um, and, 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 you know, we try, you know, society tries to correct that problem and, and, and I, and I, and I, which I feel has to be done and, and it has to be, you know, something that we're attentive to, but at the same time, I feel sometimes in the course of that, we forget or we jump over, like there are differences between men and women. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, 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 uh, my observation is that I find that women are commonly more emotionally mature than men. Mm -hmm. And um, I concur. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from, <laughs> so from that, uh, so that's branching off the marriage topic, I would love to hear from you for my own personal benefit and for the benefit of our listeners. What is a good husband, right? What are the qualities? What are the practices? What, what, what does it take to be a good man, to be a good husband? Good. I love the question, Kastuba, and I think we should really approach it a lot from it. So to be a good husband means to have a real good sense of respect and appreciation for your wife. And to see your wife as a, a spark or a gift of life that has been given to you by the Creator, by God, by the Almighty, to develop uh, this glorious relationship. So if we, if we really start thinking like that, Kastuba, that mm -hmm. this person has been given in my life as a gift from God. Yeah. And how do I treat that God, how, that gift? It's not always easy because, you know, people can get on your nerves and you can be <laughs> like, oh, my God, I don't want to see this person again. But the idea of once you have a commitment to a person, so a good husband 
has respect and appreciation for his wife as a gift from God. And he treats her in that way. And he honors her with, with uh, he respects her, her differences and her moods. And he's willing to hear uh, and put on the table her viewpoints with respect. Mm. You know, like uh, we, this is a Kali Yuga or the age of darkness. So spiritual concepts are very perverted. And sometimes women are denigrated to such an extent that it's, it's shameful, especially in spiritual communities. Mm. But the idea in a spiritual community is that women should be so highlighted and so honored and so respected that the whole world sees that as a grace. So a husband is part of what honors and respects and takes care of his wife in that way. And he um, is uh, 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 eager to serve. So this idea of service is a scary thought for us because we all want to be served. Yeah. But our nature, our happy nature, our joyful nature is when we actually make somebody else happy. So service so a good husband sees himself as a servant of his wife. A good husband sees himself as a servant of his wife. The wife is a gift from God. And he sees how, you know, what can I do to make your life better? Hmm. You know, this is the mood of a good husband every day. What can I do to make your life better? Now, the things you just said, I think for the most part, they could be said for the wife to the husband as well. Yes. yes. But is there something particularly about being a husband? particularly yeah. about the male role. Yes, I think the male role, especially during this time, Kastuba, is that we have to, the men should take a stand to make sure that women are not denigrated or disrespected. In other words, you know, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give a kind of mundane example. You're at, the, uh, you're at the, uh, the water fountain at your job and somebody makes a joke about, oh, how marriage is a you know burden on your back or something, and everybody Amen. laughs and jokes. But a man that respect said, "No, that's not. I don't want to do that kind of joke. I, that's not my reality." Mm. So to stand up and to 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 make sure that women in all the different spheres are given their proper honor and respect, and don't be afraid to do it, okay. like what other men will think, always oh, a wimp or something, you know, Amen. to do that, and to see that. I have a responsibility for my own uh, community, my own spiritual growth to make sure that women are given their proper uh, uh, position and respect and honor. And I am the one who needs to do that. Don't wait necessarily on someone else. I would say that that might be. Sometimes we, we if men would just speak up, Kastuba, yeah. about some of the things that are going on with women and wives, then it would make a big difference. But sometimes they're afraid because what other men may say or this or that. But part of the responsibility of a spiritual man is to make sure that the, 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 the woman role is honored, respected, appreciated, and, um, you know, highlighted. Right. So I would say that that should be part of your service that you look at every day. So... And, yeah, not to not to let that uh, negative talk kind of instill right. negative conceptions in the in the right. minds. Well, yeah. paradigms that we we're just not going to accept them anymore. That's just not our truth. That's not our reality. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. You got a question, Rogan? Uh, well, we did the uh, three um, three um, sort of oh, pil perfect. pillars of advice for unmarried. Uh -huh. Unmarried couples. What about married? What about people in marriage right now? Any advice for us? I'm in a marriage. A lot of people here are married. We, we were all looking for some good advice. What do you think we should hold on to to keep marriage and family strong? And um, and how many years have you been married? I've been married. My husband and I've been married about thirty years. And as you all said, my husband's Muslim, and I'm a Hare Krishna. Amazing. Yeah. So right away, you know, that's, that is another question. Hold on. We've got more questions <laughs> because there's a lot of people on the show that are married to people that don't practice the same faith or big um, topic, big, big topic, huge, actually. huge, huge topic. And, and, and it, it's horrible to see uh, families split up over oh. different um, uh, worldviews, et cetera. And you're, I, I didn't even know this. This, this has to also go on your uh, <laughs> resume as well. Cause this is a yeah. big question for people on the spiritual path. Please, yeah. Please, yeah, whether please it's share. another religion 
That's one thing. Okay. Another thing is that a lot of our listeners, they, they've come to, the, to appreciate bhakti, but their spouse has no real idea about it. It's like, in, you know, there's this tension going on where like one person is moving one direction and then now there's some fear that this is going to hurt the marriage or, or, or there's fear on the, the person that's moving towards bhakti that they're never going to be able to understand this. And, uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a very real, real it's issue that, that we real face issue. a lot. Yes, yeah. it's true, but, and one that has to be dealt with very tenderly and carefully. Um, so you are, we got a lot of things on the table. But yeah. let me maybe, say, maybe, first of, yeah, maybe first of all, basic advice for married couples. Okay. And then when there are differences, what to do about those differences? Do we make reconciliation? Do we make some room? Do we, do we draw lines in the sand right. and say, nope, that's not good. I, it's over if this happens. So let's start with that first one, okay. please. So uh, there was uh, one wonderful uh I can't remember her name, a TV commentator. And she said that marriage is a union of two good forgivers, mm. people that forgive each other. And you start up. So part of this Raghunath is you have an int See, when you get married, you should have some acceptance or reality that this person is my well wishes. This person I'm married to is my friend. So automatically, you got a little covering there. It's not like I'm going into this with an enemy or somebody I'm suspicious of. This is someone who's got my back. And we have to have that all the, you know, as, as part of the foundational piece of our marriage. And then another thing is to just know that all marriages will have challenges. I don't care who you are. You can be the top most pure devotee. This is the material world. So you're going to have either financial, social, family. You are going to have challenges. But how you approach those challenges, if, if, if you join it like a team, and again, we say teamwork makes the dream work, mm -hmm. then that makes it all. You're not an enemy. We, 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 we both want this thing resolved. We both want things solved. I'll give an example. Parenting. Some people have different ways that they want to parent their children. Some people want to be a little more physically disciplined. Some people like to talk and verbal. So the idea is to understand that we as parents, we both want to discipline our children. In other words, we both want them to be healthy, caring, interesting, wonderful people. How we do that, it may be different. So then we have a system, what we call win-win, where I share what I want to do, you share what you want to do, and we see what we can agree on. If we can't agree on it, we are excellently moved to go get help. Always, always try to have mentors in your life that can, that care about the relationship. And they're not one side, oh, this is my son or my daughter. No, somebody's really in it for you to win as a family. And then you can go to those mentors and get help. So never, ever be afraid of getting help. That's the one most wise thing you can do. Mm. Take time as a couple to do things together. Sometimes spiritually, we, we forget that part. So we've been doing these couple retreats with the Grass Division team. Yeah. And, and they have just been the most excellent thing. So once a year, a weekend, we have couples come to a farm community and we spend time interacting, learning skills, sharing skills, crying, playing, you know, the whole nine yards. And it's such a wonderful um, uh, outlet for couples, especially spiritual people who feel like I don't have time to do this, but you have to take time to prior towards your marriage. Okay, that, that may not work with the couples on the show that don't have a, a spouse that agrees with what they're getting into. So um, but I, I understand the principle. Spend time together is a good principle. Yeah, yeah I was okay. going to say, because it could work, you know, because you, you, you don't have to agree on everything. <laughs> it might not be, let's go to the Hare Krishna farm no, and no, uh, no. worship the deity together. No, it could be uh, an, another <laughs> outing, yeah, you know, a loop sure. to uh, sure. retreats, but something together as a couple, it sort of respects your, yes. your, uh, your, your interests. Okay. So that's what another thing. And then uh, finally to, at the end of the day, realize that, you know, we're all works in progress. We're mm. all just growing. And part of our, what we do with what we call our sadhana or, or spiritual practice is to help us become more and more purified. And 
the more purified we become, Raghunath, the more we can have empathy and sen sensitivity to another person. And okay. this is so important in our life. You know, we, we have to be able to put ourselves in the shoes of our spouse, even though their experience is different from ours. And the more we practice our spiritual life and become purified, the more we're able to do that. It's very important. I laugh, Raghunath, because I said, for a hot second after Tariq Prabhu and I were married, we tried to convert each other hot. <laughs> really <laughs> hot. Oh. We dropped it and that was it. You know. <laughs> so, That's great. We're satisfied that each one is serving God in the way that he does. And what helped us is when my husband fasts for Ramadan, I also do. When he reads the Quran, oh. I also do. Hey, it's one God and I'm learning a little more how to, you know, negotiate. My husband comes to the temple, and he's an unusual Muslim, but he's definitely a convicted Muslim. And I've learned to appreciate a lot more about Islam through just being with this gentleman. Hmm. And he's learned to appreciate a lot more about the Hare Krishna. So people say, wow, if y'all can do it, and y'all two different religion, what's hmm. our excuse, you know? Well, I want to get into this interfaith topic soon. Yes. But before we do, yeah. Because we're getting hits here on our chat board. This, this idea, again, of like a lot of our listeners, especially we have ladies that are already interested in yoga and all of this, you know, so they already had that interest. Their husband, maybe not. It's just at first, it's just like, oh, she does this exercise, you know, and, and OK, that's fine. And, and there's no issue. But then that yoga path may take them deeper into spirituality, yeah. deeper into bhakti. Yeah. And, then, and then embracing new values and new ideas mm -hmm. or a new religion, whatever it may be, then tensions come up, problems come up, fears come up. Yeah. Can you speak specifically about this? Um, how, let, let's put it this way, how the person who's coming towards bhakti in a marriage or in a family that doesn't understand it, how, what advice could you share with them to help them navigate this tricky situation? Right, yeah. It is a tricky terrain and it's really, uh, but I would say, especially because um, uh, Stu, if you've come into a new practice, a new spiritual practice, after you already were in a relationship, mm -hmm. you want to be really, really careful to respect that I was already in a relationship and now I, I am the one that's introducing something different, something new. And be really clear on that. The, the idea for uh, sometimes we get anxious and we want our spouse or our partner to be a part of whatever we do. But we have to remember that our spiritual journeys, even though we come together, they're individual. And we have to allow people that room to grow. So putting pressure on somebody to change just because we change is totally not the right way to go. <laughs> it is totally not the right way to go. And sometimes it's good, especially in the beginning, to have a discussion and say, you know what, honey, um, I am feeling moved to become more and more serious about spiritual life. And this can be problems for us. So I'm going to need your help. If I'm too pushy, if I'm too, you know, be really open, ask for help in the beginning. Like and being proactive, like, be proactive. hey, I want to be conscious that this isn't creating an issue. So help me not create an issue. Yes, like that. exactly. So what, what you're saying is we shouldn't be withholding love coercing no. and manipulative no no okay oh, gotcha. so let, me write, let, let me write that let me write that one down no coercion no withholding no love no, 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 no tantrums no tantrums no, no. Okay. in fact we should actually become nicer human beings so that it would be more attractive to you know okay you're in this new spiritual thing and you're being mean to me you don't talk to me uh -huh. why yeah. do i want to be a part you know? <laughs> yeah yeah. So being really careful about that. And you have to pray because see, a lot of times people don't realize prayer is such a powerful force that because we're so tiny, what can we do? But if we have an interest in something, especially to grow and be progressive, then the Lord, the God, Allah, Jehovah, Krishna will help us. And we can pray, say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. Help me know how to talk to my spouse or help me know what to say or help me know when to be quiet. Because sometimes it's very important to be quiet and listen. Mm -hmm. It's good to be a, be a listener. I was going to add to uh, Raghunath that one of the greatest gifts that we could give anybody is to be a good listener. 
And most of us are not good listeners. Mm -hmm. And we have to practice that. It's such a healing thing to listen. Just hear somebody out. I'm not going to tell you what my opinion is. I'm not going to tell you how to do the right thing. I'm going to just hear you out and process that like that. That's a gift you give to spouse. So to become a good listener and to just try to pray for help and, you know, stand back a little bit and don't become so righteous, you know, all of a sudden I'm good, I'm practicing this, I'm better than you, you know, none of that. There but for the grace of God go I. And so we have to gently negotiate this path. And like I said, if you talk to your spouse in the beginning, ask for help, pray, a lot of that can be, you know, work, you can work with it. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. You know, even Beautiful. just, you, you just brought up another topic, prayer. Yeah, for sure. Can you tell us about, share something about prayer in your life and the role that it's played? You know, you, you, you just said something with a lot of conviction, because I yeah. think a lot of people are like, I can pray, but what difference is it going to make in the long run? Right? But, but yeah. how, what, what, what role has prayer played? And what are your thoughts on prayer? And, and that, because... Uh, I want yeah. to also make a addition to that. And is that prayer different than your normal Japa Hare Krishna mantras on your beads? Are we talking about a different type of prayer? Should that be our prayer? Should we merge both those prayers? Should there be separate practices? Yeah. Well, because God is a person and we're persons, God likes personal interaction. So personal prayers are also very good. Um, sometimes we people are a little discouraged from personal prayers because in the beginning we have all these coverings and we tend to be materialistic when we pray. But over time that will accomplish. But Kastuba, to me prayer has been the main uh, foundation for everything. I got up today and I prayed because I was in a lot of pain this morning. Mm. And I was like, Krishna, I got this program and together, what can I do? And you know, I take the medicine and that. Mm. And I just was zoomed into the prayer. I was crying, everything. And the Lord heard that prayer. So for me, prayer is really personal. It's talking to God. It's like, Krishna, here I am. What can I do without you? But it's also the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. Because that powerful sound vibration is God. And you, the more you in, the, put yourself into it, the more you actually know it's real. Like when you say Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 you are actually calling on love or sonified. You're calling on the source of all life. You're calling on the living force. And gradually, gradually, you get to know that and it gets to, you know, so it, it's a part of your, 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 who you are, your essence, your connection and your purification. So for me, I pray all the time, you know, and I chant. And I pray my individual prayers and I pray the prayers of the great uh, teachers who've gone before us because prayer is very, very powerful. It's one of the ways that we connect in an honest, a vulnerable way with God. Now there's a science to prayer. Like we don't just want to go to God and make a laundry list. Lord, Lord, go over to Sister Jones' house and take care <laughs> of those babies and get the food for Sister, you know, no. I mean, we may ask the Lord to get food for Sister Jones's baby, but we start off thanking God. You know, Lord, you are almighty. You are all wise. You, you, you're the one. You're the man. <laughs> 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 and then you say, you know, here I am. This is my situation. You know, and, you know, like, so you, you offer some, some gratitude, some appreciation, some thanks, and you tell the Lord the real deal, like you would talk to your friend. Because Krishna is our best friend. God is our best friend. And you could tell your best friend anything. And they won't hold it against you. And so when you get to that kind of level of prayer, which is what we all want to get to, then that, that empowers us, you know, like that. Thank you for that. You know, um, I want to be careful now. There's so much more I want to ask, but we're, we have 10 minutes left in this hour would be going, I want to be very sensitive to you and to your health and all of that. If we should go over time at all, or. You know what, uh, do, but I really appreciate that, sweetie. And um, it's interesting, um, you know, this, my situation now with this whole cancer thing is definitely a challenge, but being able to share 
is also such a blessing. So we, we'll go until, you know, we can go a little, we can go a little over. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much for that. Okay. So if that's the case, yeah. then let's, let's, let's move on to the topic of religion. Okay. okay. Because this is something that's been not just one religion, but many religions have been, have, have been played a prominent role in your life. Yes. And we can see that religion, you know, sometimes it, 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 it it's, it, it brings about beautiful sentiments and, and, you know, uh, it's sometimes we see it also brings out the worst in people. You, what could you share with us about the idea of religion, different religions, uh, thoughts about the religions of the world and how to understand them more? Okay. You know, uh, in the Sanskrit terminology, the ancient language, it says Dharma to Saksa Bhagava Pranita. And this means that religion was given by God. So real religion means the laws of God. It means to obey God. Somehow, this is calling you to the age of quarrel, deceit, and craziness. And so religion has come to mean some uh, formulaic rituals, the letter of the law. And so that's why people want to divide spirituality from religion. Yes. But actually, spirituality and religion should be the same. Mm. And because religion simply means how are we developing our love for God? How, how are we developing our love for each other? So because the Lord understands that all these varieties of mentalities and it, at different levels of stages of growth, he's given different religions because the idea is eventually we all want to go back home, back to God. We all want to go back to our pure, perfected, eternal, blissful state. Some people will take um, longer and some people will take shorter, depending. And so religion has been given for men. You know, animals don't have religion. I can talk to a dog all day about going to pray in the temple and he'll go and you know, do what he's going to do. You know. But for human beings, we must have religion so that we can grow. And then the religion takes us beyond into a higher transcendental consciousness. So different levels, like a school, Kastuba. You got mm -hmm. your first grade, you got your fifth grade, you got your high school, you got your college. And a wise, uh, mature spiritualist will not put down any religious person because you know you are where you are for where you need to grow but by the grace of God Krishna this is such a unique time Kastuba that the floodgates of heaven so to speak have been opened and we are uh, privy to an unusual uh, time in human uh, lifespans which is the mercy of what we call Lord Chaitanya what Lord yes. Chaitanya being God himself who came 500 years ago and he broke open the storehouse of love of God and he said I don't care what your religion is what your caste what your gender everybody can taste this love so it's a very special opportunity for all of us to taste that love and um, in the Bhagavad Gita there's a saying that says let not the wise disrupt the foolish so sometimes people may not understand what we understand so we don't disrupt them but we encourage them in their, their path of religion real religious people, like if you put Lord Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad and Srila Prabhupada at the table, they just be hugging each other and embracing each other and <laughs> having a joyful time in the floor <laughs> because they understand we are serving the same one beautiful person, you know. Yeah. Um, Radha Swami, bless his heart, he says that uh, a person, a dog always knows his master, whether the master is wearing a tuxedo whether the master is naked. <laughs> so a, a spiritualist will know God, whether somebody calls him Allah or Jehovah or Krishna, because they relate to that. And so our duty as people on the spiritual path is to really try to be tolerant and to really try to be good examples for others. This is just the main thing for all of us, bar none. And you will meet beautiful people who are very serious about God. You know, for me, I met Mormons. We practiced Mormonism for a year. Hmm. <laughs> very unusual. Your family, when you were a teenager? Or? Yeah, when I was a teenager. Wow, okay. For a whole year. And then what, what broke it down, though, uh, Kastuba, was at the time, they said that Black people could be priests in the religion. They've changed that now. And my mother said, my sons may never want to be a priest, but I wouldn't be in a religion where if they wanted to, they couldn't. Right, right. So that was the point where we kind of separated. But we okay. met some beautiful people there. 
So Christianity, um, you know, we have to see that there are differences, but the ultimate essence is what? We, we're not of this world. We're spiritual beings. God loves us all. He wants us to get along. And, you know, how, how do we do that in the most, you know, effective, efficient way? And there's a little song that I used to sing, uh, Kastuba. It goes something like, it's just a matter of time when we all see Krishna. It's just a matter of time when we all go back home. But wouldn't you rather it be sooner than later? Wouldn't you rather be a lover more than a hater? Wouldn't you rather be a believer more than a deceiver? Wouldn't you rather serve Krishna? Not right now. Wouldn't you rather serve God? So, you know, that's our You choice. can add that to your resume. Did you compose that yourself? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, that was awesome. Yeah, when my children were little, we were always singing little songs and say, yeah, all those. Yeah, keep them. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. This marriage question, stuff, you, well, these marriage things, everyone's like, going crazy and writing me privately and things. <laughs> <clears throat> They're benefiting so much. Someone wrote in, okay, when is there a pro is there ever an appropriate time to leave a, a, a marriage? Someone wanted to know. You know what, uh, uh, Raghunath, unfortunately, and I say that word unfortunately uh, really means unfortunately that there is. Huh. Because uh, just the um, craziness again of the, the, the Kali Yuga time and the, 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 you know, with this physical abuse, for example. Sure. You know, Zero tolerance. I'm sorry. That's it. I don't care. Sure. Uh, even extreme emotional abuse. But now sometimes what we do, Raghunath, is we recommend that people separate with the intention to do work and then see if we can come back together. That's a, that's a good option. And mm. some couples have, have tried that. Um, you have to be willing to acknowledge that, you know, you, you need to work on yourself. You need to work on your marriage. You need to grow. And you have to be willing to acknowledge where you have hurt someone. And again, with, with spiritual life, you don't want to play games. You're in it to win it. So, right. you know, do whatever is necessary. So, yes, yeah, sometimes there, there are times. But as much as possible, we try to get help. We try to, like I said, separate and try to work on that. Um, some, it's a lot of mental health issues going on now to Raghunath, unfortunately. In, in families and marriages. So those are some of the things that we have to, to deal with. Now you mentioned, I'm sorry, I'm going to go there, but we get these questions and I want to hear it from a person who's been through it. Okay. What happens if your person just, uh, uh your partner, uh, you found a new, you brought something new. You, you you're turned on to Bhakti. Yeah. You want, you, you start to see spirit and everything. You don't want to eat animals anymore, yeah. but you have a partner. Yeah that is fully into it, fully eat into he'll, that he or she will eat anything. They want to raise their children so they can eat anything. What do you do in such a case if you find a value in something like vegetarianism or veganism, but your partner just does not hold that as imp that important? Um, what to speak of, if you, especially if you're new, newly into this, what do you do in such cases? If, do you ever draw a line in the sand like, well, this, this is the bottom line. You can't cross this line or... How, how do you feel about that? Oh, that's a very strong point, Raghunath. We talk about principles and details a lot. Sure. If someone, is, if someone has a principle, then if you care about them, you will try your best to honor that principle. So a, it's a good time to have discussions and talk about if it's a principle for me that I don't want to kill animals and I don't want my children then if out of respect and love for me, if it's not that deep for you as a person, then honor my principle. And also talk about what, how can we compromise? Mm -hmm. uh, couples have said, okay, I mean, you know, if you would disagree not to eat it in the house. Okay. If you would agree to do that, can we do that? You know, f find out what you can agree on. And an another good thing, Raghunath, is to get help. See, it's a lot of experienced uh, ma marriage mentors now, and they can bring an objective view that really kind of makes it where it's not such a fight between the couple. 
Again. So, so it's okay, you're saying, suppose you're, you're, new found, you're, you're new into bhakti yes. and you have these new values. They weren't a value when you met, but then they're your new values. You don't, you don't want to eat, uh, you don't want to eat animals. Yes. You're saying it's okay to put this on the table now. Yes. Hey. Yes. And um, see how we can compromise, see what we can work with that. See, see why that's so important to you. See, when you love somebody, if something's important to that person, you've got to respect it. Otherwise, where's the love? Sure. You see? And so that, that has to be there. But yeah, you've got to figure out how to gradually work it. And you may not, you shouldn't do anything all of a sudden and just tear everything down because usually that doesn't last anyway. Sure. Yeah. You get so enthusiastic. Yeah. And then I think we lose touch with what the other person's going That's through. Exactly. Exactly. And you have to figure that Okay, it's not just me on this spiritual path that, that Krishna or God or the divine also has this other person. And how I act or respond is going to, you know, shape how they want to do. So if I all of a sudden become a mean, non-compromising person, why would that be attractive to them? But if I say, you know, I know this is hard, I know this is difficult, and I want to respect you, help me, like that then that gets a whole different tone to the thing. And mm. Krishna allows Kastuba for people to grow gradually. You know, mm. some people think, oh, I'm going to die if I, you know. Depending on where you, you start from is how you grow from. And mm. so Krishna is aware of that, a God. You know, that, you know, I may not be able to do this all of a sudden in my household off right now. Right. But well, now, before you get married, it's a whole different thing now. If you walk into somebody else and you say you make all these agreements and then you change, if before you get married you're clear on things, then you should that should be very clearly stated and understood, right. so it won't be uh, confusing. Right. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, I feel like you're speaking really like universal truths, and a lot of people are writing on the chat board. I'm going to heat play this over and over and over <laughs> Someone again. Wrote that. So I'm going to play this interview over and over again. And then like six people said, me too, me too, me too, me too. <laughs> no, it's great. We need to hear this stuff on a regular basis. We feel like it touches the hearts of all of us. And we're all coming from different paths and we're all, in, everybody's in a different situation. And some situations are ideal and some are just like real. And we're trying to like figure out our way in between. And it's, it, it's great to hear this from a person who has been, your life experience, we're learning from your life experience and we're so grateful. And I don't know, you said you were in a lot of pain this morning. Yeah. You, are you in pain right now? A little bit. I took medicine quite you a bit. You are so lucid and <laughs> uh, clear right now. It's beautiful to hear you speak. Yeah. Well, you know what, uh, Raghunath, my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, gave me so much and so much love. But whatever I do, it's just a drop in a bucket trying to offer back. Mm -hmm. And he wanted us to be happy. He gave us this, this whole formula for happiness. And, um, you know, despite the illness and the pain, which can get really intense and severe, I'm happy to know Krishna, to know you all, to be able to serve, to, to, to reflect, you know, uh, all these years of uh, practice, you got you, you got to practice, and then you got to take that test. Yeah. Can I ask you something else? Because yeah. this is a bit, it's practically epidemic right now. Yeah. You say you're happy, but yeah. you know me being a cynic that I am, I'm thinking, well, she probably was always happy. But probably before she ever met Krishna, she was probably happy. What do you do if you're suffering <laughs> with? Yeah, right. What do you do if you're suffering from depression, mild depression or massive depression? What's, what's, do you have a formula for people who suffer? It's like I said, this is a very common issue break, people bring up to us. It is. It truly is. Listen, Bhaganath, uh, my mother had mental health issues the last four years of her life, mm -hmm. and she lived with us. And that was one of the hardest things ever on the family, on her, everything. And what we, 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 by the mercy of Krishna, we're so grateful that we got to serve her in spite of all that. And we just, you know, surrounded her in an atmosphere of Krishna conscious music and love. And even that was a challenge sometimes, but we were able to do that and chanting. And then we've had other 
people and family members that have depression. I mean, it's hard not to be depressed in this crazy world. Yeah. I mean, I love it. Everything is just so out of order and people don't like each other and people are afraid and so, but the happiness that I'm referring to uh, is an internal thing where you're aware that everything is in divine order and I'm on the way, I'm on the road and whatever it takes, love is, is, is nurturing me and preparing me, even though sometimes it's tough love, you know. And I'm happy to know that because I didn't know that before Raga Nath. I was afraid. I didn't know who God was or what life was about or what happens after. I now know. I'm now connected. Mm -hmm. Now, for people who are depressed, they need to go get help. You know, a lot of times, sometimes medicine, sometimes, you know, just change of environment. Because a lot of this is uh, chemical imbalances in our bodies. We're, we're, we're in a point in our world history where the whole earth is, is, is doing a, what, 180. Because right. all of the poisons, pollutions, everything, everything, everything. So it's happening. It's happening emotionally. It's happening physically. It's happening spiritually. It's such an intense thing. But if we can survive, if we can hold on to our spiritual practices, if we can hold on to the reality of love, then this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. And that's how we have to see it. But I would say people that are depressed, try to get help, try to get physical, uh, medical help, try to, you know, the, the chanting of Hare Krishna is just such a potent thing. I would say let that be sort of the background of your life, no matter what you're going through, even if you're depressed. And, um, you know, we should, people who care about others should reach out. You know, we should reach out to each other and make sure everybody's okay. Call them, text sure. them, you know, like that. You know, you, now you've kind of opened up the conversation to, you know, your face. And you, you said you do the practice and you take the test, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that test, you know, the ultimate test that we all face in life is we all leave this body sometime. And so d death is there. Yes. approaching we don't know if it's going to be tomorrow we don't know if it's going to be down no. the road i assume you're in your 70s yeah, yeah um, i am um 68 you, you look great you look great thank you so then you must have went to college at a very young age or something yeah i was 17 when i went to the university of Chicago. okay so then when you got initiated you were when i got initiated it was 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. okay yeah okay yeah. so so um you know our thing on Wisdom of the Sages, our daily things, we read Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes. And, uh, and it's new to a lot of, of our listeners, you know, to, to people that have been practicing Bhakti for a long time. They're familiar with all the stories. But so much of it is centered around this idea. It begins with Maharaj Purkit. He's going to, he knows he's going to die in seven days. Yes. You know, in the, but even before we get to him, you know, we're seeing... Dhritarashtra is leaving home, preparing for death. We see yeah. Vidura, we see the Pandavas, they're all going, preparing for that moment. There's, yeah. there's so much in the Bhagavatam on the subject of preparing oneself for this moment. And yeah. we, you know, I think probably all of our listeners, we, we, we see around us different examples of people who are facing death. Yeah. Commonly, it's, it's a time of fear. Yes. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a time, you know, there can be bitterness, there can be fear, there can be some trying to reach back into the past and enjoy something that's now gone, you know? Um, Bhagavatam is kind of gearing us to go into, uh, in one sense, to understand that it's not a death at all. It's a, it's a death of the body. But we see, I've seen so many beautiful examples. You've seen so many beautiful examples. Yeah. Raghunath Prabhu, you know, he's seen so many beautiful examples because we've been practicing Bhakti for some decades of people who approach this final chapter, final test in life with a type of clarity. Both Raghunath and I, and I think all of us are, are, are looking at you and just saying, you, you seem like you're in a better mental state than all of us, <laughs> right? You're, you're, you're facing- why are you, why are you so blissful? <laughs> yeah. So could you share with us your thoughts about facing that final challenge in life? Uh, how it's affected you, how you feel going through it, what we should keep in mind as we live, knowing that, you know, sometimes we don't think about that, but it's gonna come. Right around the corner, yes. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's do that. 
Um, when I look at you, Kastuba, I see your spiritual master. Ah. <laughs> that is so nice. Thank you. I, uh -huh. I'm glad I could play some role in, uh, uh -huh. in, in bringing people's minds to some, some higher topic. Um, but yeah, I wrote an article for the Back to God here about a couple of years ago about what to do to paying for debt because mm -hmm. it really is a the reality that um, anything born must die. And we, we avoid talking about that, but I think we should talk about it a little more. And there's reasons. It's a fearful thing. Most people don't know what happens after death. So that's very frightening. But for us as spiritual seekers on the path, we have a very good idea that we'll continue our spiritual journey, that we'll uh, you know, keep growing and we'll go to a, a higher situation to keep practicing love of God. And then, but for others, it's like pain, because death can be very painful. And that who wants that? And then others, it's the separation of people you care about. Like, how will I see my mother again, or my brother, or my husband, or my wife that I love so dearly? And all of a sudden, boom, it's over. It's over. It's final. <laughs> but again, uh, for spiritual seekers, we know it's not over. It's not final. I will see Prabhupada again. In fact, I see Prabhupada all the time. Uh, I will see my mother again, you know, because we are eternal blissful beings. And this interlude in our life is just that. It's a, it's a period of time. It's kind of like an illusion, a dream. And we're playing a certain role, and then we have to finish that role and go on. So I think talking about death more and being aware of the fact that we are, are the body is a different, a whole different thing than the soul. It's a machine, it's a vehicle, it takes us from one place to another. So this body is taking Krishna Nandini, the soul, Devi Jasi, to my next destination. And by the mercy of the great souls, Prabhupada, like that, it'll be a glorious one because this is, you know, what I've been preparing for. At the same time, there are elements of sadness there, Kastuba, my children, you know, they have so much love for their mother and they have just been just awesome. I'm just done. Mm. I mean, they have just tried to take care of me in all the ways they can and just, you know, and it's good because a lot of the superficial stuff, you know, we, we just go into the priority. Relationships and love and, you know, connection. And so that that's there. Um, I have five sons and five daughters that I've given birth to and they all in a unique way have contributed to me being who I am as a devotee or servant of God. I like to say my children have purified me, you know, because just taking care of them, just knowing that I was so insufficient to care for them. Like, how could I do this? So I had, that was why I prayed a lot. Lord, these are your children. You got to feed them. <laughs> you got to chastise them, <laughs> you know, like that. So, but yeah, um, so preparing for death, knowing that, Krishna loves us and he wants us to do well. And this death is just the door opening to the next reality. So trying to get in that consciousness. And as we read Bhagavatam, as we talk to devotees, as we associate, the reality of that becomes real so much so that we don't have to have fear. That's the thing, fear. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada, you know, our guru, he, he, his name was Abhay Chalan. He was fearless because he was aware that Everything is controlled by Krishna, God, and he's in charge and he's here and he's running the show and I'm just an instrument. And so he didn't have to be afraid. You know, even death is God for a mm -hmm. devotee. See, death is God for a devotee. And so that's how we look at it, you know. I sense that you are entirely fearless going into this. Me too, me too. <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful thing to say. Can I ask you an important question? Pastor, would you mind if I ask another question? Yeah, you know what I was thinking? Is that um, why don't we ask a few questions, almost like rapid fire questions, like like quick, because I don't want to, okay, you go ask one more and then we'll ask right, a couple quick ones. Okay, right this up. might yeah. not be rapid fire though, because right. <laughs> I'm thinking of, okay, you've got loving children. Mm -hmm. um, and in in leaving this material world, there's a lamentation, a sadness, they love me, I love them. So you have to break that attachment and understand I don't own them. What do you do in a case where you're leaving, 
but there's been people that have hurt you, people that have wronged you, people that aren't reciprocating with your love, but you've given so much to them. How do you let go of resentment if you know you have to leave the body? Or even if you're living in this body, how do you let go of it? Thank you, Ronnie Knox. I love that question. <laughs> yes, that's the question. Because if you don't let it go, you're coming back here and doing some silly stuff. <laughs> it's going to be part of that vicious cycle over and over again. Yes, through. yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, we understand in the material world that uh, we're all playing a Leela, a role, and some roles cause people to fight each other, and some roles cause people to love each other. In the ultimate issue, it's just a role, and we get to realize that. And so we forgive people because they're playing their part of the drama. It's like they have a script, and that is their part. And you know, if they do their part well, that, that's actually excellent. And for all of us, Krishna has put all of these different things in our lives to help us grow. That's it, period. Whether it's the good person or the bad person, the demon, or the, that's all that is there to, for us to grow. And if we focus on what the person did and what they didn't do, we won't, we won't grow, number one. And we will have to come back and play a part of that drama again. So if you want to just you let it go, you say, Lord, that's why Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, and they know what not mm -hmm. to do. And you, you say that. Example Prabhupada gave, um, he is a pure devotee, Prabhupada, totally self-realized soul. Yeah. He's walking down the street one day, and someone said something negative, which people usually didn't do that, because Prabhupada's aura was such that it always just attracted high. But in this case, it was a reason. And so the devotees were going to sort of beat the man up. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Prabhupada said, no, you don't know what I did to him in my past life. Mm. Ooh, nice way to Very say it. Very profound instruction. So I, 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 I appreciate it in one of your previous interviews. It, I mentioned briefly that there was some management at this original temple and they were kind of dismissive yeah. of you and, and, yeah. not, and not trusting your family and so on. And then many years later, that person came to you and apologized and said, I'm so sorry that I treated you that way. Yeah. And if I could go back in time and take it back, I would take it all back. And then you said, oh, no, no, <laughs> I wouldn't well, want you to take it back. I wouldn't let you take that back. I said, because of how you treated us, how badly you treated us. <laughs> we ended up getting initiated by Jaga Guru Srila Prabhupada on Rod Hastami with the <laughs> installation of Radha couldn't ask for better than that. So, that is good. Yeah. That's a great. We have to we have to forgive people because they're playing their role. They're they're the instrument of our karma. And so if we get too attached to that, now that doesn't mean, Raghana, that we let people walk all over us and misuse us. But okay. it does mean that we release the feeling that we have to pay somebody back for what they did. Mm. That's not gotcha. the we, we, we spoke, of, you know, we had a question a week ago about forgiveness mm -hmm. on a question and answer session. We read this whole statement by Yudhishthir from Mahabharata about forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And, and one of the things he said, and this is something that's caught on, uh, our listeners really like this statement, but he, Yudhishthir said, forgiveness is a quiet mind, mm -hmm. right? Forgiveness mm -hmm. is a quiet mind. That, that if, we, if we don't let go of these things, it just stays in the mind. And I can see in you right now, You've got that quiet mind, a quiet mind that Krish that you can just bring Radha and Krishna into without any distraction or disturbance because you're not hanging on to all this stuff. Oh. Yeah, you're not replaying angry revenge, revenge scenarios, <laughs> turbo scenarios in the mind. Mm -hmm. The mind is very peaceful. Your face is very peaceful. Your heart is very open. You're you're very again lucid, clear, and in, in, in giving truth. And, and we aspire to be like that. Well, I swear to be like you all, sharing such a wonderful uh, forum with all these devotees and connecting people from all over who have an interest in spiritual life. This is so beautiful. Because, do you have one more good I, I, I was thinking, question. let me ask three questions, rapid fire, okay? okay? Because we've had you 20 minutes over, and I don't want to go over an hour and a half. My son, Sean, is going to probably say, okay, my That's right, that's right. I know your kids, I, you know. So uh, th that their love for you, they want to protect you. So let's, let me ask you just three quick rapid fire questions, okay? okay. T share with me something. A lot, of our, a lot of our listeners are yoga teachers and stuff. 
Okay. Tell me something about being a good teacher. So being a good teacher means being a good student. Mm. It means being really learn, knowing that I am learning from those that I think I teach. And I have learned from my teachers. Um, Prabhupada said, because I heard nicely, I could speak nicely. Mm. He heard from his teachers. So being a good teacher means always being a good student. Thank you. Good. You mentioned that you also, in your, in your, uh, the book that you put together and all that, you speak about finance and stuff. Tell me about money. What should we keep in mind when we deal with money? We should keep in mind that everything belongs to Krishna and it should be used in his service. And that actually, Krishna wants us to really do well. I mean, in the beginning, in the Bhagavad Gita, he explains that he put us all here with all the elements we needed for physical, spiritual, and material success. So if we understand that everything belongs to Krishna, we try to use it in that way and try to um, use money or whatever it is to enhance uh, our spiritual growth and our spiritual life and that of others, that's the proper use of money. And therefore, um, you know, we'll get the, 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 the dynamic energy that goes from that. And Krishna wants, especially householders, to have money. <laughs> so. You got to figure out how to do it in honest ways and share it properly. That's honest it. ways. Thank you. Yeah. You got to be honest. Last, you got to be honest. Last, last question. Um, tell us something that we should all understand about love. Mm. Wow, that's, that's awesome. We should all understand that Krishna God loves us so much that it is just, it, there's no words that could say that. And his love for us is so deep that he's hankering for us all to be properly in our relationship with him. We, we, we lost our relationship with our love, with our eternal permanent love. And everybody else is just a part of that love. But the whole love is right on Krishna. And they love us so much. They want us to do well. They want us to be success. And so we just accept it. We accept the love and share it. That's how you accept it, is by sharing it. Thank you. And, and with that will be our last question. I'm just going to ask one last favor. Okay. That um, in your prayer, that you think of all of us, Wisdom of the Sages, whole family, thousands of listeners. Okay. And you pray, please pray and bless us and, and, and all of us, uh, that we may be able to, to, to move nicely along in this path, that we may be able to cooperate with one another and go deeper and deeper and deeper into our into our bhakti, into our spirituality. Okay, we'll say that prayer right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. My dear Lord Chichi Radha Krishna, dearest Srila Prabhupada, dearest Lord Chaitanya Nityananda, in the book you know to our court. As we are all sitting here today in this magnificent opportunity to talk about you and to connect with you again, we are asking your special mercy in the name of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, this being his holy appearance day, that a special, special blessing come to every one of us who are connected in any way with this podcast, that we may go deeper in our connection with you and deeper in our ability to share that love with others so that we may know what it is to live in peace and harmony and with all varieties of people and we thank you, Lord, for answering the prayer before we even asked it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do now? We're all going to tell her. Now we dance and sing. First of all, I want to thank you so much, Krishnandini. You are an inspiration for us. You are a beacon of light. You are a lighthouse. You are a dropped pin on the map where I want to go. And you've inspired us all. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the name of that book again. What was the name of that book? The name of that book is Heart and Soul Connection. There it is. A devotional Guide to Marriage, Service, and Love. It's plugging. I have another book called the Ryan Number Book. It's Plug away. There's another one called the ABCs of Standing Hare Krishna. There's you, another one called the Booklet of Eight. Now, if you want to go to my website, it's yeah, what's the website? Krishnanandini.com yeah. at the store. Mary, you want to spell that? Krishna. A I S N A N A N D I N I dot com. 
Krishna K R S N A. Okay. K R S, no I. K R S N. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks everybody on Facebook joining us today. We do this every day, seven days a week, pretty much. We usually do it at 8 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday, 5 a.m. Eastern time for early birds. If you want to join us for, it's a great way to wake up and start your day. And um, you just go to uh, uh, Apple Podcasts, or if you want to join us live here on Zoom, which is even more fun because we all know each other, and there's a huge community. You go, you, you write Mayor, our assistant, at Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. If you're one of the people out there listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube, go to Apple Podcasts. Write us a review. Tell us how you got here. Stop, tell us. Uh, uh, what the show means to you. It means a lot to us to hear your story. And if you like what we're doing, it is a community-supported podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages, patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. And for any contribution, you can enter into the inner workings of our, um, of our, uh, of our little uh, secret group here where we have regular yoga classes every day. You can download the whole bundle for practically nothing. And then um, we have backlogs of classes, workshops, and trainings. Thank you so much. And this is my favorite time of the day. We all sing together. We take that namaste, turn it into a hand clap. And then we lip sync a little. <laughs>